I am overjoyed to be here with my neighbors, friends, and colleagues to celebrate the life and achievements of Francis Crow. <laughs> And also to welcome Amy Goodman to Smith College. So, if you would, please take the next few minutes to think about and record any questions you might like to present to Amy after her talk. Our student ushers will be collecting them in a few minutes. My name is Maureen Callahan, and I am the steward of the Sophia Smith Collection of Women's History at Smith College. On behalf of, thank you, um, on behalf of Smith College Libraries, it is my pleasure to welcome you and to thank you for sharing your company with us this evening. We come together to, this evening to address a question. What can one person do? The Sophia Smith Collection has existed since 1942 and began in a moment when the idea of having a place to bear witness to women's accomplishments was a new idea. Indeed, we were one of the first three places in the world to establish an archive solely dedicated to women. Our mission, then and now, is to collect documentation of how people have changed the world for women and other gender minorities, particularly in the realms of civic participation, the right to shape family and sexual life, the creation of feminist artistic communities, and the attainment of full human rights. Recent additions to our collections include creative work from the cartoonist Alison Bechtel, the records of the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, the records of the Prison Birth Project, the records of the Association of Women in Mathematics, and the papers of individual activists, including Linda Burnham, Dorothy Pittman Hughes, and Jane Fonda. We collect so that we can begin to understand the story behind the story. The traces in their own voices, in our diaries and letters and internal memoranda and frustrated emails, our sketches, our artworks, our poems, of how the work really happened and how lives are really lived. We do this too so that others may use this as evidence to understand the past and create new knowledge about how the world works. This event is an opportunity to celebrate and bear witness to Francis's life. In the past weeks, I've taken an additional opportunity to return to Francis's papers, which are housed here at Smith College in the Department of Special Collections. This is an opportunity that is available for anyone in this room, or truly anyone in the world, and I hope that you take it. During the construction of the new Maya Lin Design Nielsen Library, we are located in Young Library on the second floor. Please visit us. When you do, and when you request to see Francis's papers, I think you may be as struck as I was by the breadth and depth of her interests, the ceaselessness of her activity. Her papers are constituted of more than 65 boxes and hundreds of posters, all of which come together to tell a story of a life of conscience and action. In addition to being a parent and a partner, a friend and a neighbor, and a member of her spiritual community, Frances concerned herself through the course of her lives with issues as varied as draft resistance and conscientious objection, anti-apartheid action, greed and energy, the disparate impact of nuclear power on indigenous Americans, the creation of a local teen center in Northampton, political and social change in China and the rights of Tibetans, the Valley Women's Union, the rights of prisoners. I'm sure it's not surprising to anyone who knows Francis that this list continues. But I think that when you come to the archives, you will be moved by how personal and specific it feels to be among Frances's files, evidence of her life, her image, and her handwriting. And if you follow the same research path that I had, you may also encounter an address written and given by Frances, recorded on three by five index cards and secured at the top by a piece of white yarn. In her address, Frances compels her audience to see themselves as people with power, the power to change our relationship with violence, the power to prevent world annihilation and the proliferation of nuclear weapons. She says in this speech, I have worked for many years to educate myself and my community about the futility of war. I have vigiled, marched, prayed, written letters to the editor, held meetings, shown films, and other words, organized against the nuclear arms race. I worked through all possible legal channels to prod Congress to cut off funding for testing, production, and deployment of nuclear weapons and nuclear vessels. Frances goes on to provide moral clarity and expert activist guidance to her audience about how they, too, can be one person changing the world, finding another person, finding solidarity, and creating necessary change. 
So friends and neighbors, let's all together, in the Quaker tradition of which Francis is a part, take a moment of silence to reflect on this life and one person's model, and to consider ourselves as people coming together to form communities and movements. Now, I am very happy to welcome Claudia Lefko, activist, founding director of the Iraqi Children's Art Exchange, longtime educator, and friend of Francis. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of the celebration for Francis Crow. If you're wondering where is Francis, she's here sitting in about the third row. So she's here, not to worry. Um, uh, when I'm finished, the ushers are going to be going up and down the aisle to collect your questions, so get those ready. I want to say a special thanks to Sut Jolly, who's walking right here, the director of the Media Education Foundation. And to everyone, yeah, Sut, thank you. And to everyone at the Sophia Smith Archives who's made this, uh, this event with Amy Goodman possible. I also want to thank Emma Kemp, Smith College's own budding journalist, for her interest, enthusiasm, and great writing. Emma, where are you? Wave at us. Yes, she wrote a great article in the Sophian. And I want to give another shout out to another of Smith's own, artist and sculptor Harriet Diamond. Harriet, are you here? <laughs> Class of 73. It's Harriet's art has helped to define and inspire the events of the past week. So thanks to everyone who's made this possible. And I want to then pay a special tribute to Ed Russell, a longtime media activist who, alas, died on Saturday at the age of 57. Some of you here probably know Ed. You may not have known that he passed. He died from complications of multiple, from multiple sclerosis, which he suffered from for many years. It was Ed who fam famously pirated an unoccupied radio frequency in the early 2000s to broadcast Democracy Now! into the valley every day. Yay, Ed! First, first, and this is a correction. In the newspaper, we said he went to Mount Tom, but of course, that's in East Hampton. Ed walked on to Mount Holyoke up at the, the Summit House. So first he broadcast from Mount Holyoke and later from Francis's basement. Ed was one of those who worked with Francis to bring the democracy now onto the legal airwaves it occupies today. WMUA 91.9 FM at 8 o'clock every morning and uh, XOJ, our local FM station uh, at 103.3. I think it's on twice a day. It might be on more than that, but at least twice a day. So. If you'd like to honor Ed and, and pay special tribute to him, Francis would like uh, to suggest that you make a donation to either WXOJ or to Democracy Now. Um, you can find out information about how to donate on their website. So during the last 10 or 15 years, Francis would stand up at every and any event, no matter what the subject or the purpose of the gathering, and she would ask, how many people listened to Democracy Now! this morning? So if you want to declare yourselves, hands up. She carried in her pocket cards that listed all the stations within a certain radius of the valley and the times you could tune in to hear the program. And if you didn't get Democracy Now! in your town or on your campus, she had information that she could give you on how you could bring it to town or to campus. One chapter in, fame, in Francis's memoir, Finding My Radical Soul, is devoted to the media. In there, she tells the tale of how she discovered Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! in the early 2000s, and then worked for some two to three years to get it on our local airwaves. Democracy Now! became a mission in her life, and Amy Goodman became and remains one of Francis's heroines. 
Democracy Now! was a new tool in Frances's organizing kit. It literally changed the way she interacted with people. It gave her a way to focus conversation on issues rather than niceties. Instead of asking how are you or what's new with you, Francis, and if you know Francis, I'm not making this up, Francis would greet people by asking, did you listen to Democracy Now! this morning? What did you think? And this brought her right where she always wanted to be, engaged in a meaningful discussion with friends, neighbors, or strangers. And so it seemed only fitting when Frances was turning 100 that we would bring her heroine, Amy Goodman, to Northampton to celebrate and honor Frances. Amy Goodman is part of Frances' history. She's part of her archives. She's part of what the Quakers call the beloved community that has grown up around Frances. So because everyone wants to have a word with Amy and Frances, and that's really not possible because I'm at the microphone or we're up here and you're down there, let's do a mic check. Check. Mic check. Francis. Thank you. Louder. Thank you for, for bringing us. Democracy Now! Amy. Welcome to Smith College. A century of women on top. Amy. Thank you. For our, daily, for our daily, independent, independent news, fix. news fix, Amy, Amy your, work your work has changed our lives, changed our lives. And, improved and improved the world. What do we want? Do we want? Democracy. 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 When do we want it? Yeah. Democracy. Yeah. De Democracy. Democracy now. Democracy now. Welcome, Amy Goodman. Wow, it is wonderful to be here and to be looking directly into Francis Groh's eyes. Hi, Francis. Now, organizers that we are, does anyone have a Democracy Now! flyer that I could borrow just for the time of, because actually it has the secret speech written in a kind of invisible ink. I'm kidding, but did anyone get a flyer today? that said all the places that you, we broadcast Democracy Now. Okay, uh, we're doing very well. Um, it is such an honor to be invited here. Um, for me to be able to come up to uh, be with Frances on her 100th birthday. I can't think of another place that I'd rather be or another woman that I'd rather be with right now. Happy birthday, Francis. So, just before we came here, we were at Set Jolly's house, and I asked Frances how many times she was arrested. You know, as a journalist, I like to stick to the facts. So I said, Frances, how many times? And she said, not enough. <laughs> so I see we have more to cover in the future, so I'm really looking forward to that. I also asked her about her first activism, the action she was engaged with. And she talked about how she and her husband, a radiologist, who deeply understood what nuclear power was all about, it was 
after the dawn of the nuclear age, the use of nuclear weapons that were the first inspiration that made me think about the convergence of the importance of independent media and what happened then. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. August 6, 1945, the United States drops the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, killing well over 100,000 people. Most of the press went off to the USS Missouri to cover the surrender of the Japanese. Um, this was after the bombing of Nagasaki as well. But one crusading independent reporter, Wilfred Burchett, would have none of that. And he took a train for 30 hours to Hiroshima, even though General MacArthur had called the whole area of Japan off limits. He broke the sound barrier. He went to Hiroshima. He got out of that train and saw the horror of the dawn of the nuclear age. Wilfred Burchett emerged from the train into a nightmare world. The devastation that confronted him was unlike anything he'd ever seen during war. The city of Hiroshima, population 350,000, had been raised. Multi-story buildings were reduced to charred posts. He saw people's shadows seared into walls and sidewalks. He met people with their skin melting off. In the hospital, he saw patients with purple skin hemorrhages, gangrene fever, rapid hair loss. Burchett was among the first to witness and describe what he called atomic bomb sickness, what would later be called radiation sickness. Burchett sat down on a chunk of rubble with his baby Hermes typewriter. His dispatch began. In Hiroshima, 30 days after the first atomic bomb destroyed the city and shook the world, people are still dying mysteriously, horribly. People who are uninjured in the cataclysm from an unknown something which I can only describe as the atomic plague. He continued tapping out the words that still haunt to this day. Hiroshima does not look like a bomb city. It looks as if a monster steamroller has passed over it and squashed it out of existence. I write these facts as dispassionately as I can in the hope that they will act as a warning to the world. Reaction to the horror shocked readers. In this first testing ground of the atomic bomb, I've seen the most terrible and frightening desolation in four years of, world, of war. It makes a blitz Pacific island seem like an Eden. The damage is far greater than photographs can show, he said. Compare that to the reporter for the New York Times. Burchett's searing independent reportage was a public relations fiasco for the U.S. military. General MacArthur had gone to pains to restrict journalists' access to the bomb cities as military censors were sanitizing, even killing dispatches that describe the horror. The official narrative of the atomic bombings downplayed civilian casualties, categorically dismissed reports of the deadly lingering effects of radiation. U.S. authorities responded in time-honored fashion to Wilfred Burchett's revelations. They attacked the messenger. General MacArthur ordered him expelled from Japan. The order later rescinded. His camera with photos of Hiroshima mysteriously vanished while he was in the hospital. U.S. officials accused Burchett of being influenced by Japanese propaganda. They scoffed at the notion of an atomic sickness. The U.S. military issued a press release right after the Hiroshima bombing that downplayed human casualties. Four days after Burchett's story splashed across the front pages around the world, Major General Leslie Groves, director of the Atomic Bomb Project, invited a select group of 30 reporters to New Mexico. Foremost among them, William L. Lawrence, the Pulitzer Prize-winning science reporter for the New York Times. Groves took the reporters to the site of the first atomic test. His intent was to demonstrate that no atomic radiation lingered at the site. Groves trusted Lawrence to convey the military's line. The general was not disappointed. Lawrence's front page story, U.S. atom bomb site belies Tokyo tales. Tests on New Mexico range confirmed that blast and not radiation took toll. The language that William Lawrence would use to describe the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki 
Well, Lawrence was in the squadron, the planes, that dropped the second bomb on Nagasaki. His report was withheld by military censors until a month after the bombing. He described the detonation over Nagasaki that incinerated 100,000 people. He waxed awestruck. We watched it shoot upward like a meteor coming from the earth instead of from outer space, becoming ever more alive as it climbed skyward through the white clouds. It was a living thing, a new species of being born right before our incredulous eyes, he said. Lawrence later recounted his impressions of the atomic bomb being close to it, watching it as it was being fashioned into a living thing so exquisitely shaped that any sculptor would be proud to have created it, one felt oneself in the presence of the supernatural. This was the reporter for the New York Times. He would win the Pulitzer Prize for a series of 10 reports on the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. A few years ago, I went up to Columbia University to the Pulitzer office. Um, my brother and I, David Goodman, a wonderful journalist in Vermont, had done a series of exposés on this, and we called for the New York Times and William Lawrence posthumously be, to be stripped of that Pulitzer Prize. When you think of the crusading independent reporter and why we need independent media, Wilford Burchett, writing those words that ring true to this day. And I think that inspired Francis Crowe from the beginning. We write this as a warning to the world. And Francis has been answering that warning by standing up for, and many times sitting down or laying down, um, to stop the war machine, to stand up for all of our rights. Today, she is not only wearing her Democracy Now! t-shirt, but, but wearing also that pin that doesn't say peace. It says no war. From her anti-nuclear activism that she has engaged in all of her life as an adult, to taking on the US militarism in Latin America, in the 1980s. Moving on to take on, before that, the Vietnam War, just before I came here tonight, she was describing one of the times she got arrested. It was at Westover Air Force Base in Chicopee. And she talked about the effect of this protest on the people on the other side of the line, on the base. The remarkable effects of bearing witness. Francis and other women were dressed as Vietnamese women, and they went there each day. On the other side was a pilot, a bomber from Vietnam, and he watched these women. His name was Donald Dawson. He was there on leave, went back to Vietnam and found himself weeping rather than bombing. Francis, somehow through her remarkable ingenuity, she became a draft counselor, urged people not to go to war, found his address, got him a packet of information, and Donald Dawson would become the first conscientious objector of the Vietnam War. I wanted to share with you another moment of silence, given what we've just come out of this week, the horror that took place on the other side of the planet in New Zealand, the massacre of 50 Muslims as they prayed in their mosques.
50 Muslim worshipers in Christchurch, New Zealand, brutally gunned down in two mosques by a single gunman armed with an arsenal of legally purchased semi-automatic weapons. In a sick modern twist, the killer, 28-year-old Australian Brenton Tarrant, live streamed his rampage on Facebook. The killer, arrested apparently unharmed, published a manifesto online before his murder spree in which he defined himself in rambling prose as a committed white supremacist. He said he was a supporter of President Donald Trump as a, quote, symbol of renewed white identity and common purpose. He condemned non-white immigrants using the words invaders and invasion over 80 times in those more than 70 pages. On that same day of the attack last Friday, Donald Trump issued the first veto of his administration overturning Congress's rejection, Democrat and Republican alike, of the national emergency declaration he's trying to use to unilaterally fund his border wall. At the signing, Trump, like the Christchurch shooter, also used the word invasion. Trump said, it's an invasion of drugs and criminals and people. He added, in many cases, they're stone cold criminals. You have killers coming in and murderers coming in. Echoing back four years when he began his presidential campaign, talking about Mexicans as murderers and rapists. Now, to be fair, last Friday, President Trump did take the time to call the New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda, uh, Jacinda Ardern to express condolences, and Ardern talked about their call. She said, he asked what offer of support the United States could provide. My message was sympathy and love for all Muslim communities. Her pointed reply was clear. That day, when addressing her nation in response to the massacre, Ardern, at 38, the youngest female head of state in the world, said, many of those who will have been directly affected by this shooting may be migrants to New Zealand. They may even be refugees here. They've chosen to make New Zealand their home, and it is their home. They are us. The person who's perpetuated this violence against us is not. They have no place in New Zealand. Contrast her remarks with those made by Trump after the white supremacist neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville in August 2017, where the anti-racist activist Heather Heyer was killed, scores injured. Trump said to reporters days later, you also had people that were very fine on both sides. He said, on Friday, Prime Minister Ardern immediately called the white supremacist attack terrorism. She went on to say, we're a nation of 200 ethnicities, 160 languages. We open our doors to others and say welcome. She said, we wish for every member of our communities to also feel safe. Safety means being free from the fear of violence. But it also means being free from the fear of those sentiments of racism and hate that create a place where violence can flourish. She said, every single one of us has the power to change that. The weekend following the Christchurch massacre, last weekend, Donald Trump tweeted over 20 times, never mentioning the massacre again, but rather attacking everyone from the late Senator John McCain to his own favorite network, Fox Network. He was attacking Fox because Fox had suspended program host Janine Pirro after Pirro attacked Minnesota Congress member Ilhan Omar for wearing a hijab. I think she called it a hijab. Ilhan Omar is the first member of Congress to wear one. Khaled Beydoun is a man we call to join us on Democracy Now! He wrote the book, American Islamophobia. He said, 
This kind of rhetoric that we see from white supremacists at the very top, like Trump, whether it be words like Islam hates us or using dog whistles like invasion, this is embolden of emboldening terrorists like the terrorist in New Zealand. Beydoun wanted to redirect the media attention from the shooter to the victims. He began putting out names, photographs, personal details of some of the victims on Twitter. He said these were individuals who led lives. They were young kids, like three-year-old Mukhad Ibrahim. They were individuals who were as old as 72, like Haji Daoud Nabi who was the first identified victim standing at the door who welcomed in the terrorist into the mosque. He said, I tried as much as possible to put a face on who these people were, illustrating stories that showed these people were far more than just statistics. As Prime Minister Ardern went out to comfort the mourners, she too wore a hijab. She also promised swift action to change the nation's gun laws. And within six days, she has now ensured that New Zealand has banned semi-automatic semi -automatic weapons. As New Zealand mourns, she strives to place the focus on the 50 victims, on their names, on their lives. Speaking in the New Zealand Parliament Tuesday, she said of the shooter, you will never hear me speak his name. She opened her remarks to the Parliament, to her nation and the world by saying, Salam Mulaka, peace be upon you, peace be upon you all of us. Yes, Jacinda Ardern shows Trump what leadership looks like. And then I wanted to talk about another story that is unfolding as we are here today, the investigation of that Boeing Airlines Flight 302 that had taken off from Addis Ababa heading to Nairobi when it crashed moments after it took off. The tragedy provoking global outrage as news circulated that the newly designed aircraft, the Boeing 737 MAX 8, has software flaws that make the plane inherently dangerous. Country after country last week grounded all MAX 8 and 9 airplanes, with only Canada and the United States where Boeing's headquartered holding out. Then Canada grounded the planes, and President Trump buckled under the growing pressure and ordered the planes uh, grounded as well. He said, airplanes are becoming far too complex to fly. <laughs> he said that a day before issuing the order. Is it that planes are too complex, or that U.S. regulations are too lax and that passenger safety is consistently sacrificed to benefit large corporations like Trump's ally, Boeing. Among those killed was a young woman some of you may know, 24-year-old Samia Stumo. She just began working for Thinkwell, an international development group committed to expanding healthcare access. She's a graduate of UMass Amherst. She just earned her master's degree at the University of Copenhagen. Samia hailed from a family of engaged citizens. Her grandmother, Laura Nader, a renowned and beloved anthropologist at the University of California, Berkeley, her great uncle, Ralph Nader, legendary consumer activist, former presidential candidate. Grieving over the tragic death of his grandniece, Samia, Ralph called Boeing's headquarters. <clears throat> Failing to get a reply, he penned Boeing an open letter titled, Put Passengers First, Ground the 737 MAX 8 Now, highlighting the prevailing belief that the crash of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302, like the similar crash of another MAX 8, Lion Air Flight 610 in Indonesia last October, together those two planes 
which killed all crew and passengers on board, well over 300 people, was caused by faulty software. Nader wrote, your own lawyers should be counseling you that Boeing is on public notice and that heaven forbid a Boeing 737 MAX 8 crash in this country. The arrogance of your algorithms overpowering the pilots can move law enforcement to investigate potential personal criminal negligence. Clearly, you run a company used to having its way. So the Associated Press did a deep dive into a public government database where pilots voluntarily describe the problems they have flying. It wasn't long before they found one complaint after another about this Boeing 737 MAX 8 and 9, which relies heavily on artificial intelligence software that consistently causes the plane to nosedive. One pilot wrote, the captain engaged the autopilot after reaching set speed. Within two to three seconds, the aircraft pitched nose down. The Wall Street Journal reported a critical software update was due to be installed in all Boeing MAX aircraft, but due to the December-January government shutdown, the software fix was delayed for five or six weeks. So we had Ralph on the next day. This is the day after he learned his grandniece was dead. He just had dinner with her last Friday night before she left. He said, I can't come into the studio because I will not be able to keep my composure, but I'll speak to you on the phone. He said, when the government shutdown occurred, I made a comment that this is going to cost lives. They were shutting down life-saving federal regulatory agencies, health agencies, software upgrades between Boeing and the FAA were put on hold. Donald Trump is directly involved in this, he said. Donald Trump has publicly praised Boeing hundreds of times in his two years in office and participated in efforts to sell its planes, including the 737 MAX series, to countries and airlines around the world. He last was trying to sell Boeing planes at the North Korea summit in Vietnam to Vietnam. Boeing CEO Dennis Mullenberg praised Trump's support at a dinner last August at Trump's Bedminster, New Jersey Golf Club. Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan, appointed by Trump, spent 31 years as a Boeing executive. And now Trump's former UN Ambassador Nikki Haley has been nominated to the Boeing Board of Directors. Ralph Nader wants Boeing executives and Trump himself to be called to testify before Congress under oath. Nader knows the personal pain of losing a loved one to a needless plane crash. The time is now for robust regulation with a priority on passenger safety, holding accountable those who put corporate profit over human lives. Now, <clears throat> before we um, break for a Q&A, and I get to talk a little bit to our great Francis Crow, I wanted to share a story as we come out of this past week the remarkable climate school strike led by the 16-year-old Swedish. <laughs> Swedish climate activist named Greta Thunberg, who when Swedish parliamentarians admonished her when she sat for three weeks on the steps of the parliament to go back to school, she said, no, I'm here because I did my homework. I got to meet her in Poland at the UN Climate Summit in Katowice. She co-hosted Democracy Now! with me at the time she was 15 for that hour. And we interviewed Kevin Anderson, the great climate scientist, and also uh, Greta Thunberg's father, Svante, named for his great uncle, a climate scientist as well. And Greta addressed the UN plenary at the climate summit, went on to address the European Union in Brussels. And she said, because you all are acting like children, let's let the real children lead. <laughs> but I thought I would end by taking a few extra minutes to tell one story about climate resistance that is so important that takes us from the past into the future. And it is the story of indigenous tribes in this country who are leading the way for a sustainable future. I want to talk about the standoff at Standing Rock. <clears throat> 
I'm going to do this really fast because I'm already out of time. But on April 1st, 2016, the unofficial historian of the Standing Rock Sioux in North Dakota, named LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, opened her property to what she called the resistance. She said, anyone can come and set up teepees and tents on my property. It's beautiful property along the Cannonball River in North Dakota. Set up a tent to oppose the Dakota Access Pipeline, what Native Americans call the Black Snake. Uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline that takes fracked oil from the oil fields of North Dakota through South Dakota, through Iowa, Illinois, and then hooks up with a pipeline to the Gulf of Mexico. And Native Americans in North Dakota were saying no, not drilling under the Missouri River, the longest river in North America that can peril the water supply of 17 million people downstream, Native and non-Native, no. Now, the Standing Rock Sioux were not unusual, actually. They're typical North Dakotans, right? The North Dakotans of Bismarck, the capital, said no, not here and their views were honored. The people of Mandan, where the courthouse and the prison is, where hundreds of indigenous people have been arrested and protest, they said, not here, and their views were respected. The Native Americans weren't so lucky, and they took a stand. So LaDonna Brave Bullard thought a couple dozen people would come, she could manage that. Uh, the, their camp was called the Re Sacred Stone Resistance Camp, but it wasn't a couple dozen, it was a couple hundred, and then it became a couple thousand people, indigenous people from Latin America, the United States, First Nations from Canada, non-Native allies from all over the world, and soon thousands of people were there saying no to this oil-based economy saying we have to develop a sustainable way to live or we will all be imperiled. Now this was 2016, this was the presidential election year. You'd think this issue would be being raised constantly through this year. During the general election debates, the, I won't call them journalists, the media personalities who moderated them, <laughs> never once, never once, asked a question about climate change, let alone the standoff at Standing Rock. Never once. I was on a panel with Bob Schieffer from CBS, and I laid this out, and he said, okay, there we might have made a mistake. <laughs> so the people kept gathering and protesting. They didn't call themselves protesters, they called themselves water protectors, and Democracy Now! headed there late. We were covering it from afar in New York, but we came there Labor Day weekend of the presidential election year. And on Friday, we landed in Bismarck. We immediately covered these amazing protests. You know, women in traditional garb and girls, men, boys, they would start their marches in the back roads of North Dakota with a water ceremony holding glasses of water, offering it to the fully militarized sheriff's departments who met them with tanks, with MRAPs, with drones, with automatic weapons. And they would say, this is for you, not just for us. This is for your children, not just for ours. I mean, you know the scene of these militarized police departments. You might know it from Ferguson. Remember a few years ago when the African-American teenager Michael Brown was gunned down by a white police officer, his body left to bake in the hot August sun hour after hour, and the people rose up, and they said, no, we will not be treated like this. And they were met by these fully militarized St. Louis area police departments like we have never seen. Corporate journalists were there and they were getting tear gassed and so you heard all about it. This is recycling in America today. You take the weapons from Iraq and Afghanistan and you give them to the police departments of the United States. How do you think they're going to respond? This all has to be challenged. And that's what people were doing in North Dakota. Truly amazing. And we covered these protests. We were filming them. And then September 3rd, 2016, it was Saturday, a group of Native Americans went to plant their tribal flags in an area, a disputed area they called their sacred burial ground. And a judge was about to rule on this the following Friday. And he said, if you say it's your sacred burial ground, you give me a map, prove it. And they did. 
they made a map of the area, they gave it to the judge, and then the judges, judges do, gave it to the other side, that's Energy Transfer Partners, which owns the Dakota Access Pipeline. And so when they went to plant their tribal flags, I mean, it was also a holiday weekend, they didn't expect that uh, Dakota Access Pipeline was gonna be actually building in the area that was disputed, but they had, the Native Americans believe what they had done is they had taken their bulldozers from way down the road, and because they had the map, they put them here, and they were already excavating this area. They believed it was so that it would be a moot point when the judge ruled. They would have already changed the facts on the ground, already dug it up, and this infuriated people, and they stood in front of the bulldozers, these huge, earth-crushing machines. The bravery I can't describe of these women and girls. And the bulldozers pulled back, one after another, one, two, three, four, five, six, they pulled back, and the people kept marching, and more joined from the Red Warrior Camp and Sacred Stone Camp and all the resistance camps as they marched forward. And it was then that the Dakota Access Pipeline guards unleashed dogs on the protesters. Dogs. And they were biting the water protectors, but they kept moving forward. We filmed a dog with its nose and uh, mouth dripping with blood. The Native Americans were beaten, they were bitten, they were maced, they were tear gassed, but they kept moving forward and ultimately they prevailed. And the dapple guards, the bulldozers pulled back at a ridiculously high price, but they prevailed. We went off to post this online, this video, and we had to fly back to New York. Um, I go on the networks on MSNBC and CNN, and often say, why aren't you covering climate change? You know, the fate of the planet. And they'll say, the hosts, we want to, but the executives say people's eyes glaze over when you talk about climate change. Well, this proves them wrong. In one 24-hour period when we posted this, 14 million views, it would make any corporate executive drool to get that kind of coverage. In 24 hours, the response was enormous. We flew back to New York, we continued to cover the protests leading up to the judge's decision that would be Friday. And then on Thursday, it didn't look good for the tribe because the governor at the time of North Dakota, Governor Dalrymple, called out the National Guard in preparation. And then the authorities in North Dakota quietly um, issued an arrest warrant for me. I didn't know this at the time. So on Friday, we did the show, and then Nermeen Sheikh and I flew to Canada. I wasn't fleeing. I didn't know there was an arrest warrant. But we were invited to the Toronto International Film Festival because they were showing a film called, well, about I.F. Stone, the great muckraking journalist who told young people, if you can remember two words, remember governments lie. If you can remember three words, remember all governments lie. And then the film went on to talk about journalistic organizations that are following in its footsteps. They were chronicling democracy now, so we came to talk. And I wasn't going to come, but I thought we just were eyewitness to this. People in Canada care about First Nations, so yes. Um, I'll describe what I saw. And the next day at University of Toronto, there was a crowd like this, and we were talking, and I got up, and I was speaking, and in the middle of the talk, I got a text, and it said, you're under arrest. <laughs> now, I was confused, because I looked out in the audience, I said, okay, this is a bunch of young students, and someone figured out my number, and it's like some kind of scam, and I'm not gonna like play into it, I'm not gonna say anything, but then I saw there was a North Dakota number attached to this. I thought, okay, this is probably serious, and I have a problem because it's not like I'm gonna be arrested immediately unless I have to interact with police, FBI, or border guards, and I have to go back over the border to get into the United States. So I didn't think I'd make a big deal of this. If I could beat the arrest warrant into the system, I could get home. So I just said, could someone call me a cab? <laughs> and I got in a cab and I raced to the airport, and I did make my way back to New York. But we did learn it was true, and I didn't take it personally. I thought, this is a message to all journalists, do not go to North Dakota, which is exactly why everyone had to go there. And I also wanted to really make it clear to young journalists. I mean, this was a historic event going on in North Dakota, the largest unification of Native American tribes in decades. 
And if someone wants to go to cover this as an independent journalist and they don't have the resources or the institutional backing, they shouldn't have to feel that they're going to get a record when they put things on the record. We had to challenge this. We had to call their bluff. So the next few weeks, we flew back to North Dakota. We were flying into Bismarck, and as we land, we learned that the um, authorities had quashed the arrest warrant. But then I learned that they were going to bring more serious charges against me, felony riot charges. What, like I'm a one-woman riot? What are they talking about? <laughs> so I called my North Dakota lawyer, not that I had one before, and I said to him, well, what does this mean? And he said, it's not the worst thing in the world. So I said, okay, just like out with it. And he said, maybe a year in jail. I said, a year? How much time do I have? He said, three days. Monday at 1.30, you'll be arraigned. Okay, so we could cover the protest for three days, which we did. Oh, we also issued a press release to say that, um, well, I was going to be arraigned, and I asked the judge's name, and they said, don't be ridiculous. This is rubber stamp. They rubber stamp everything before the arraignment. But then I said, judge means to me discretion. They said, not now, after, you know, in a trial or something. I said, okay, so this judge is going to decide on whether I will be arraigned. We put that out. Apparently, he was getting a lot of calls over the weekend as we were covering the protests. And on Monday morning, well, the show must go on. And you all know from watching or listening to Democracy Now!, if you watch or listen live. Um, and boy, I have just endless thanks for Francis Crow and Ed Russell, that they actually set up this transmitter, Ed, on his back, in his backpack, and then passing it on to a Francis. But we're going to hear about that in a second when I talk to Francis. Uh, this is amazing ingenuity that brought us to the valley. I can't even believe it. But you know that every morning at 8, Democracy Now!, the show must go on. And in North Dakota, it was at 7 AM. So my colleague, Dennis Moynihan, got a broadcast truck sent up from Minneapolis, and we set up in Mandan, where I would have to go to court. So we broadcast from a church outside, across the street from the courthouse and the prison with the Ten Commandments in between. <laughs> and as the sun came up, I would do the show and then turn myself in. So I interviewed the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux. At the time, it was Dave Archambault. Um, and I asked him, have you been arrested? He said, yes, I was. I was engaged in civil disobedience. He's the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux. Like, you know, Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States. And I said, well, what happened when you were arrested? He said, low-level misdemeanor. Yeah, it's like a parking ticket. I said, yeah. And he said, I was strip searched. I was put in an orange jumpsuit, and I was jailed. I thought, oh, orange jumpsuit. That would actually match if, but um, 45th chairman, 45th president. So then I interviewed Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle, who was the pediatrician on the Standing Rock Reservation. She was one of the first to be arrested because she cared about the health of the children. And I said to her, what were you charged with? She had low-level misdemeanor. What happened? Oh, I was put in an orange jumpsuit and I was jailed. How much humiliation can a people take? I was at the Man uh, Bismarck Airport one day, and a guy came up to me. I was reading a magazine get it to get on a flight, and he said, you don't think I don't know who you are? I said, oh, well, who are you? And he said, I'm one of the guards who was on site that day that you were there, and I worked for the Dakota Access Pipeline. I said, so you were one of the people who unleashed the dogs on the water protectors? He said, no. We were as surprised as you were. They hired three different companies. We were not among those. And we were surprised too. He said, you don't think I get it? We massacre them for hundreds of years, and then we unleash dogs on them. You don't think I don't understand why they're so angry at us? And so I say, especially to young people when I speak at schools, never assume a person's position based on their position. So uh, we did the show. Hundreds of... Hundreds of Native Americans came to show their solidarity. The time was ticking down. Riot police were lining up on the courthouse side next to the Ten Commandments. We thought there was going to be some kind of confrontation, not on the part of the Native Americans who had come to perform ceremonies, but the riot police were getting aggressive. It was at that point, as we stood there amongst them, 
that we got a call from North Dakota Public Radio. The host had been there for decades. He knew the state, uh, almost everyone in it, and he said, the judge will not bring the charges against you. He cannot bring himself to sign the, to sign the charges, even for the arraignment. And it was not only me that was saved that day. Most of the Native Americans who faced felony and riot charges that day had those charges dropped. This is what happens. This is what happens when the media spotlight shines in the right direction. This is the kind of reality TV we must all support. Not the kind that he stars in, but the kind that actually shows the reality of people's lives on the ground. This is the kind of media that will save us. And I'll just end by saying, I really think or see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. I really do think that if for just one week the media showed the casualties of war, that if the top of every surviving newspaper above the fold, we saw a photograph of a baby on the ground and we learned her name and the circumstances of why she was laying there, lifeless in Afghanistan. If we knew her story, if we knew the story of the woman who was hit by a US drone strike in Yemen at a wedding party, if on everyone's Facebook wall, we every day for a week talked about the casualties of war, a soldier dead or dying, if every tweet, if every email mentioned someone's name directly targeted by war, Americans are a compassionate people. They would say, no, war is not the answer to conflict in the 21st century. But I want to end, actually, with the words of one Francis Crow. At the back of the book, and I hope you all get this wonderful book, Finding My Radical Soul, a memoir. Francis writes, remember, once people believed in human sacrifice, not anymore. Once people believed in slavery, not anymore. Once people believed women were not as intelligent as men, not anymore. I hope you'll be able to say in your lifetime, once people believed in war, not anymore. Democracy Now! Thank you so much, Amy. So we have some questions from the audience. <laughs> um, and the first one says, as a journalist, how do you balance the importance of appearing impartial with the desire to fight for your beliefs and convictions? How much activism is too much activism for a journalist? That's a good question. Um, 
You know, that's often an issue that's raised by the corporate media, though even there on the networks these days, um, they've changed their approach. But, you know, my lesson I take from them, I know the views of every network host on television. When you represent the status quo that is still taking a position, but what's so interesting is that the status quo does not represent most people in this country. You know, you think about the people on television. These pundits that you see on all the networks who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. And I think the reason democracy now has grown so much in the 23 years we've been on, the first year, you know, we're on nine stations, 1996, we were the only daily election show in public broadcasting. We were going to wrap up the day after the election. Thank God we didn't because um, then Frances Crow would never have gotten the opportunity um, to broadcast democracy now from her house uh, for everyone else to hear in the area. But there was more demand for democracy now after that election than before because we were going state to state using the primary system to hear what people were doing in their communities. I never thought that people were apathetic, but most people weren't voting. So what were they doing? And I think the authenticity of those voices struggling their communities, you just rarely heard that in the mainstream media to the point where now we are larger than most any news show on television in the United States because, <laughs> I mean, Necessity is the mother of invention, and from the beginning, you know, we had no money, and so in order to broadcast on stations, we use the internet, which is also why we have to key, keep it open and free. The internet that was developed with public resources, we can't let the telecoms and the private um, uh, companies that want to now privatize it because it's so valuable write the legislation. We can't let that happen. Um, this is the great equalizing force in the world if we keep it open. Corporations have always been able to communicate with each other, globalize around the world. At the grassroots level, we need an equal playing field, and that is an open and free internet. So we use the internet to pass the show which around to stations, which also meant people could access it well before the word podcast even existed. And so from the beginning, we had a global audience. And then it just took off. That was 1996, 2001. We went on television right after the 9-11 attacks. We were the closest national broadcast to ground zero. We broadcast on one station in New York. TV station asked if we'd do emergency broadcasting. And then stations all over the country asked for it. And then we were on not just Pacifica stations and college stations. NPR stations started asking, PBS stations. And now we're at that 1,400 station mark um, in the United States and around the world. And my answer on the issue of objectivity is, as journalists, we have an obligation to be fair and to be accurate. And I think it's important to let people hear your views, but to let other views be heard. Um, and to provide a forum for people to speak for themselves. That is our obligation. Thank you. Amy, this question comes from Maya, and they are a Smith student. What is your perspective on institutions like Smith that have some history of pushing for social justice, but are also very much a part of power structures? How can we as students push our institutions in the right direction? Well, well, I'd like Maya to come up to talk about how she's doing just that. But, um, uh, you know, I want to say that, unfortunately, when I came here today on the train, I didn't have a chance to go over to Hampshire, but I did want to go to visit the people who are <laughs> occupying the president's office, because I think they're not just doing this to keep Hampshire alive, but they're doing this for all 
education and institutions of higher learning in this country, and it's a very serious issue. And I think that college is such an important place, not only to study, but to be active, to be aware of every aspect of your life, and to make your views known, to be involved in groups, not to just to do things individually, and to be involved not just on campus, but to link up with the community as well, because we are really all one. And the campus, just like the community, just like any place you are in your life, is the place to engage in activism and fighting to making the world a better place. So this question is from Felix Noldi. Felix, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. How do you respond to critics who say that a major flaw of democracy is its inability to tackle urgent global problems like climate change in a timely manner because democratically elected leaders worry too much about being reelected instead of making unpopular but necessary decisions? And Felix provides the example of USA versus China. Um, well, I would say uh, on the issue of unpopular, that's where I would disagree. Issues like climate change, I think people all over this country and the world deeply care. Um, I don't think these are unpopular. They may be unpopular with those who give the most money in campaigns, but as we're seeing with various grassroots presidential campaigns right now, the people who are raising the most money are doing it from the largest number of donors with the smaller, smallest amount of money. I think everything is changing in this country right now around politics, and that is really a very good thing. For example, look what just happened in New Zealand. I mean, this is a democratic nation where in just six days they have overturned um, uh, the entire system around weapons availability. Uh, because of this massacre in just six days. In Australia, several decades ago, I mean, this is a country of crocodile dundees, of, uh, you know, gun lovers, Australia. After the Tasmanian massacre, I think 35 people were killed. Within a number of weeks, they also banned automatic weapons. It's only in this country, in the United States, where you have this incredibly powerful, financially backed lobby that any attempt to change the laws, and the Parkland students are so just astounding in their efforts. I think we just have to take a longer view. I think it's going to happen. Well, the Parkland students teach us that. I mean, with that kind of determination, it can't not happen in this country. So we have to take a longer view. Organizing makes the difference. A free media, opening up the discourse in the media, you know, supporting independent media because when you have networks, that are brought to you by the weapons manufacturers when we cover war, that are brought to you by the insurance industry when we cover health care, that are brought to you by the coal, gas, and nuclear companies and oil companies when we cover climate change. When we have that kind of media, the range of debate, let's say on war, for example, is going to be whether we bomb by plane or should have boots on the ground. But when we have independent media, not brought to you by these moneyed interests, the question is if we will engage in war at all. This question comes from Abi uh, Peller. Many of my undergraduate students tell me they cannot bear to watch the news because it is increasingly, quote, too depressing, unquote. How do you respond to young people's need to shut off in the face of despair? We'll turn into democracy now. And the reason I say that is because of the voices you hear. I mean, the people, the pundits, 
are the people who are engaged in changing the world. And that's why it is so hopeful. Um, we have classes that come every day to Democracy Now! to watch the broadcast, in addition to people who are tuning in around the world. I mean, I cannot believe the response. One day, and it's, you know, we plan this show every day for the next day. Almost never, I have no idea what we're doing Monday and Tuesday. Tomorrow, maybe, and sometimes it's dependent on what, you know, Trump tweets at six in the morning, and then we dump, have to dump a guest. But um, each day we plan the show for the next day. So these classes come, they're planned in advance. We have no idea what's going to match with what. And we had a group of fourth graders about a year ago. And I walked in and went, oh my God, it was Noam Chomsky for the hour. <laughs> I said, okay, our, our education director, Samin, is going to have a behavior problem from eight to nine here. <laughs> but it was this wonderful French illustrator and filmmaker who had made a film about Gnome called Is the Man Who is Tall Happy? Um, and we started the show, and Gnome was talking, and these kids, I looked out at the audience after about 20 minutes, were like this. <laughs> I think especially young people have an especially long attention span. We have just been taught the opposite. Yes. That when you're going to bring someone different ideas, you have to go from A to B to C to Z and take them on this journey that brings you into a very different place. And you need the time. And, you know, when a guest comes on Democracy Now!, I always warn them, do not speak in sound bites. Because what can you get in eight or nine seconds? This is something that Noam Chomsky says, right? You can only get the standard wisdom. Saddam Hussein was like Hitler. Four seconds, everyone knows what you're talking about. But if you are going to say that U.S. government officials are involved with war crimes, you might fit it into the eight or nine seconds and you're ready for prime time, but you sound a little crazy. What do you mean? Because no one else has said this. And then you need the time to explain what are the Nuremberg, prison, uh, what are the Nuremberg principles, what are crimes against humanity and war crimes, and you need time. So we've got to explode this formula in media, and we find at Democracy Now! that sometimes when we play a speech for the hour and public radio and television say, don't do this, this isn't how you do a news show, that brings in the most audience, and then of course those stations are actually more and more interested. I don't even remember what the question was, but that was the answer. <laughs> oh, how can you get depressed when a 10-year-old girl who challenges Senator Dianne Feinstein. We have her on Democracy Now! <laughs> Together with her 12-year-old brother, Rio, and 16-year-old, um, Isha, who went into Di Fai's office in California. This is right before the climate strike. They were very upset because she wasn't supporting the Green New Deal. And they challenged her. And she said, I have 30 years of experience. You don't think I know what I'm doing? I think the 10-year-old said, no, I don't. <laughs> and, um, and she said to the 16-year-old, how old are you? And she said, I'm 16. And she said to her, well, you didn't even vote for me. Why should I listen to you? She said, I'm still your constituent. And the 12-year-old said, this is our future, so you have to listen to us. And then the great moment when I asked them about whether they had heard Greta Thunberg, which they had heard, which is why they were leading the climate strike in their school and they were walking out of their school on the Ides of March, last March 15th. Um, and I asked them, have you heard um, of Greta Thunberg? I know it was the 10-year-old girl who said, I love her. I mean, the media is a way to connect people all over the globe. And as Greta Thunberg said, if you're going to act like children, let the children lead.
So would you like to join Francis yes. for a conversation? Okay. So I am going to just take a walk down here to choose just one member of the audience already picked out, pre-planned, though her script is not written. Presenting the inimitable, creative, incredibly generous, kind, unrelenting, persistent ex-con <laughs> centenarian. Francis Crow. You really did. It was so good. From the heart. It was wonderful. Now, everyone has to be everyone has to be very quiet here. Um, and I hope you can all see. And maybe people at the very back can stand, but you can't stand in front of the people behind you. Um, Francis, not to be self-serving here, but when you told me the story of how you brought Democracy Now! here, I was so deeply touched, and especially because um, you had a co-conspirator who just recently passed last week, Ed Russell. But if you can describe how you guys made this happen. Well, Ed was convinced that democracy now had to be heard by everybody. So he downloaded it uh, from his computer onto a disk and uh, drove up to the parking lot uh, over at uh, Mount Holyoke. And then in a backpack, he had the transmitter and the disk and he walked up as high as he could go and then threw the antenna in a tree and broadcast democracy now. Did and you say in a tree? In a tree. <laughs> and, and it really went all over the valley. Now, Ed had multiple sclerosis and he had a hard time walking. So after that, and then he came on Saturday to the vigil. And he said, I understand you're trying to get democracy now on the air. And he said, tune on your radio Monday, 4.30 to 5.30 on 103.3, and you'll hear it. And he said, it's from the top of uh, Mount Holyoke. And it was incredible. Uh, so I did turn on, and then I talked to him the next day, and I said, Ed, you know, you should not be doing this because I'm afraid the roads are going to close very soon. You won't be able to get up the mountain. Because it was wintertime? Win winter was coming, and I said, I will help you. We'll try to get it in a building in Northampton. And I went all over Main Street and around with the taller buildings. And the only one who agreed to broadcast it was Peter Ives at the First Church. He said, <laughs> <laughs> but he said you would have to climb up the steeple. And I said, well, Ed would not be able to do that. And I said, why don't we try my backyard? I said, I'm higher than a Main Street, Northampton. So uh, the next day, uh, he came with his transmitter in his backpack and uh, an antenna. And I said, let's throw it up into my walnut tree in the backyard. And, I love walnuts. And it worked. I drove around town halfway to Amherst. I still could hear it so clearly. So I said, Ed, I'm buying a transmitter. I'm getting a carpenter to put up a pole in my backyard, and you can help me 
uh, work out the details of it. And so we were in business. In about a week, we were broadcasting for my yard. And we did that for a long time until someone finally ran this alternative pledge campaign so that uh, tell, urging people online to not contribute to WFCR until they broadcast Democracy Now! And in one week, I think $40,000 was withheld. And then Martin Miller called me and said, Francis, come over, let's talk. <laughs> and, <laughs> so... He said he would download it and stream it over to WMUA, the student uh, station, if they would broadcast it. So uh, I had to join the board of WMUA, and the students all you know, thought, what's this old lady doing to, uh, talking to us? And so I sat it out and tried to slowly get parts of democracy now on some of the people who had programs on the station. So, you know, finally, after a year and a half, they agreed to broadcast it. And they say it's really the best thing that they ever did. It's improved the quality of the station, so they love it. <clears throat> and how this got transmitted, transmitted to us in New York, um, that the problem in the Valley has been solved, uh, that Democracy Now! is broadcasting from a hangar in this woman's backyard named Frances Crow. Um, but uh, meeting Frances years ago at the train station, and from that time until now, I can only say how remarkable your dedication to people's voices being heard and to taking action. Though the title of the talk was The Power of One, I actually think Francis has taught us exactly the opposite. It's the power of everyone together. And that's what we thank you for so much, Francis. That's right. <laughs> but and I urge you not to work alone. Look around and find people who agree with you and together build your own little movement. It's too discouraging and hard to work alone, but to find other people. And I think if you uh, look around, you'll find people, many people who agree with you and together you can work. And we have all kinds of groups now in Northampton. You know, the Workers' Center, the uh, Resistance Center, and on and on. Uh, people, you know, coming together and trying to, to resist with compassion and change the world. Francis, I think we have to join in a round of Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Francis Crow, happy birthday to And thank you, Amy, for coming to New York, Northampton. You'll be on the air tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. So she has a long way to go tonight before she is home. But I really appreciate your coming. And I'll be so much more inspired. I cannot wait. Thank you, Frances.
Friends, my name is Matilda Cantwell, and I'm the Director of Religious Life and College Chaplain here at Smith. And as you can imagine, I am feeling very daunted by the task of having the last word here this evening. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to figure out a way so that Amy and Francis have the last word, even though Amy has to catch a train. And Francis, you're looking wide awake, but I imagine it's getting to be bedtime for many of us here. So forgive me uh, while I call my thoughts together. I've been given the charge to give all of you a charge, bringing together what we have heard this evening. And unfortunately, um, as Amy said, there's very little that can be said in 40 characters or seven or eight words. But I will do my very best. A great many of you in the audience today are fierce and tireless advocates and organizers. Yet, you, if you are anything like me, you have moments where you look at Francis or Amy and considering the fact that your main goal is to just get through the day, you realize that Amy or Francis does more in one hour than you do in a month or perhaps a year and you may feel a tiny bit discouraged. But let us turn to the subject of this talk, what can one person do, and let us turn to these powerful words that we just heard, what can one person do and what can and must one person do in community. Amy, you have impassioned, agitated, and inspired us with your poignant, pointed, and epic energy, which in person is even more profound than on the airwaves or cable. I am truly electrified. Some things I have observed this evening, I will say everyone has a Francis story. And here in Northampton, we often, when someone says they have a Francis story to tell, there's a little bit of, oh, tell me, I can't wait to hear. And then there's a little bit of eye rolling. Oh, no, here we go. They're going to one-up us with their Francis story. My quick Francis story, preparing for tonight's event and another event, which is bringing the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons to here in Smith College. I was sitting in my office. I got a phone call on my landline thinking perhaps I was late signing timesheets or some such thing, and I heard a voice, Matilda, it's Francis Crow. I want to bring the campaign to end nuclear weapons to, uh, uh, to Smith College campus, and how are your boys? I should have clarified, <laughs> this is after she asked me if I had listened to Democracy Now! that morning. <clears throat> I have two sons, now aged 8 and 11, that have come with me to rallies and events ever since they were young enough to be carried, but the fact that Francis remembered their existence, let alone the gender that they are associated with, is beyond striking, never mind that her memory at almost twice my age is twice as good as mine. But that brings me to my first charge, which I present to you with the deepest humility. We can't all be Francis Crow or Amy Goodman, but with the urgency of the task of the preservation of this precious and broken world around. Let us be like them, people who take notice. What Frances really wants for her birthday is for all of us to be Frances Crow and Amy Goodman to one another. With all the legislation they interrogate, campaigns they work on, war zones they cross through, elements, human, natural, political, they cross, Frances and Amy notice and therefore they remember. History cannot be made without memory, and memory cannot be made without noticing, without interrogating. Things that might seem insignificant, contributions that might seem small, the personal elements of one another's lives, while they may seem irrelevant, are the things, in fact, that may matter the most. By taking the most, taking and noticing what was most beloved to me in the world, Frances makes me want to be close to her that to, and the work that she does. Since that work is mending the world, that is no small thing. So let us keep our eyes open and take stock and note of our fellow humans and the worlds that they exist in and the ways their lives intersect with our own. The other day, one of my sons, the 11-year-old, asked me, not rhetorically, but with his burgeoning social consciousness, said, Mama, what exactly is it that makes Amy Goodman different from other news? As always, before speaking to my 11-year-old, I had to think before articulating what I feared might be an inane and horribly mistaken, mangled answer. But I may have gotten it right somewhat this time. She tells the truth, I said. 
Many news sources are tied up with corporate interests and increasingly tragically, as Amy gestured to, as she said, with a propagandistic mechanism by which hate and fear are produced and crafted into what is made to look like reporting. Even many who we consider representing fine liberal journalism are tied to, in one distorted way or another to the, the way things are, the status quo, and to one story about what matters and committed to downplay and cover up or worse. Amy interrogates the things we take for granted. She unpacks even the things we might prefer not to see. As you may have noticed and observed from this evening, as you may have noticed and observed by watching her show, Amy gets to the truth by deep listening. <clears throat> we cannot all be Francis Gro or Amy Goodman, but we can tell the truth by listening, and we do so, as it says in the great Hindu text, the Bhagavad Gita, with not, without thought of the fruit of our actions. So with the urgency of the task of preservation of the precious but broken world around us, Ask good questions even if you think the answer should be obvious, even if it is something you do not want to see or want others to see. And finally, the most obvious, and a chance to pivot from my refrain, even though not all of us can be Francis Crow or Amy Goodman, this quote from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. <clears throat> What we need to be is ourselves and mind the gifts we are given that will be the leaves of the tree of peace for the trunk needs the chlorophyll from each little leaf to stay alive. We need to be like Francis as a Quaker, people of hope, otherwise known of people of faith. Faith is fueled by encounters with the kind of level of suffering that we have heard about this evening. We need like the independent journalists, the war protectors and the youth we need to them, we need them, like them, to keep moving forward. The other day after the New Zealand massacre, I admit I almost despaired at what to say. We have been here so many times before. A Muslim student came forward and said, we will continue to say assalam alaikum, peace be to you, you are welcome here. Having hope means having faith. This does not mean you have to believe in something supernatural. It means continuing to go forward, like the people we have heard about this evening. Even if you have to change your course, even if you be, have to be uncomfortable, even if you are face-to-face -face with suffering, even if you are terrified sometimes in getting closer to the truth, faith is the fuel of hope. We have named in the past few days white nationalism. We urge one another to call our legislators to tell them to listen to our youth rather than kowtow to the NRA. Our charge to those of you that are baby boomers who might say, what are the youth doing? I urge you to look closely at what the youth are doing. As Frances is noticing what she has longed for, they are indeed changing the world. And when we think their habits are strange, those of you who came of age in the 60s remember what they said about your hair, your music, and what you were smoking. <laughs> to finish, again, it has been a huge and very daunting honor to have the semi-last word of our uh, talk this evening. I call us again into the urgency of the task of the preservation of the precious and broken world around us by calling us to notice, listen for the truth, tell it and never stop going forward. Never be daunted, but instead be inspired by the example of another. Never be daunted by the enormity of, a ta of the task, but inspired by the work. In order to um, finish together as a community, I will repeat a couple of words we heard this evening and ask you to repeat them. And then if Francis or Amy has a, has a chant they'd like to end us on, I will defer to them. This is what happens. When the media spotlight shines light upon people's lives on the ground. In the words of Amy Goodman, 
Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay, don't repeat this. I have a chant. Francis, do you have one? Shall I offer a chant for us? I'm going to offer a Martin Luther King quote for our ending chant. How does that sound? I'm not sure. What? All right. When, when I say it, you're going to know, because I think you're the first person that told me this quote anyway. Martin Luther King said, the arc of the moral universe is, is long, hard. but it bends towards justice. justice. It's up to us. <laughs> it's up to us. Thank you. Not bad. Yes. Amy yeah. Goodman, please come back. Oh. Okay, I'm supposed to go up there now.